How her great-uncle became a murderer was initially only of marginal interest to political scientist Katrin Himmler. She wanted to learn more about her immediate family. She questioned relatives and did research in public archives. But the topic was taboo at home. She was told that Himmler's brothers had been apolitical people, having little to do with National Socialism. In the beginning, I was mainly interested in the actual relationship between my grandfather and Heinrich Himmler, how close they really were, whether they had a fraternal relationship, how well they got along privately, and whether their political views were perhaps more similar than I'd always assumed. Katrin Himmler discovered that her grandfather, Ernst Himmler, had a good relationship with his brother. Apparently, the whole family was proud of Heinrich's meteoric rise. His two brothers and his parents were not guilty of actual crimes against humanity like Heinrich had been. They may not have committed any murders, but they were fundamentally in agreement with the system and its ideology. They conformed to the racial laws with conviction and saw to it that the Nazi ideology was practiced in their sphere of influence. Blood and soil stories fascinated Himmler from an early age. During the Third Reich, his team systematically searched for Germanic settlements. One day, Teutonism will supersede Christianity, predicted the Reichsführer, who had long lost his Catholic faith. To this end, he had pagan customs revived, such as the midsummer and midwinter celebrations. At the Externsteiner near Paderborn, SS researchers dug up the area in an attempt to find proof of the existence of a great Germanic empire, to no avail. Himmler's envoys traveled all the way to Tibet, looking for evidence to support his imagined theory about the origin of the master race. In the end, the Teutonic cult remained a miserably failed attempt to establish a new view of the world. Himmler also tried to unveil anti-Christian roots in the Middle Ages. He specifically revered King Henry I. In 1936, Himmler made a pilgrimage to the king's tomb in Quedlinburg Abbey. In his speech, Himmler said that Henry, like Hitler, had had to assume a terrible legacy, with Germany's eastern territories lost to the Slavs, as was the case today. But Henry had finally succeeded in reintroducing the Germanic principle of loyalty between the leader and his followers. Bevelsburg is an inconspicuous castle near Paderborn. In the mid-1930s, Heinrich Himmler chose this site to become the pseudo-religious sanctuary of the SS. It is said that the death's head rings of deceased SS leaders were kept here in the crypt. Today, over 70 years later, the ceiling is still adorned by a swastika. I believe that setting up this organization really suited him because he had always liked being the one who organized things and had the overview, as well as being paternal. He was always happy to look after his people. Later, he also saw himself as a kind of uber-father of the SS, the person who felt responsible for everyone, for his men as well as their families. He saw to everything personally, but at the same time, he also liked to see himself in a position of power from where he could meet out punishments whenever he deemed it necessary. So he lived in this twin capacity, which I think he'd adopted from his father, paternal and benevolent on the one hand, but very strict and rigid on the other.